Up here on the screen, we're going to put a, a picture. Uh, this is of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And uh, if you're familiar with this, you know that Michelangelo is the artist who painted this incredible fresco painting. Now, the, the, the Pope came to Michelangelo and said, hey, I really want you to do this. And Michelangelo said, hey, I really don't want to do this. And uh, I guess when the Pope says, no, you're going to do this, then, then you do it. And, and so he ended up doing it. And, and our, our, our image of, of how this all played out is like this incredible scaffolding from the floor all the way to the ceiling. And, and that Michelangelo is probably laying on his back, right? And he's, he's painting on his back. And he's in this big old space all alone. The reality is he was an inventor too, right? I don't know if you know that. And so he invented this, this scaffolding that was attached to the walls. And so it was an invention of itself, but he actually stood while he painted. He wasn't on his back. He stood up and he painted. He actually had pain in his back and neck for many, many years because of that. But he also didn't do this alone. He had a team of 13 people that helped him paint this amazing, amazing painting. Now, he had the vision and he knew what he wanted to do, but it took this group to, to almost four years to actually finally finish this incredible work of art. When you and I look at our lives, what we find is that our, our lives are full of teams. Like every aspect of who we are, we're, we're in a team. Whether that's at work, at home, in relationships, our whole life is in experiencing teams. Now, now, we've experienced teams in healthy ways, and hopefully you've been able to experience that, I should say, where you've had a team that has worked well together and great things have happened and you've reached your goals but more than likely, you've worked in dysfunctional teams, too. Patrick Lencioni wrote this in the five, distinction, excuse me, the five Dysfunctions of a Team. He said, the fact remains that teams, because they are made up of imperfect human beings, are inherently dysfunctional. Like, because of us, because of people, teams tend to move toward dysfunction. Now, if you think about dysfunctional teams, there are probably some different uh, characteristics to the, these teams that make them dysfunctional. Let, let me share a few of those with you this morning. One, selfishness. Uh, we talked about this a little bit last week. We were talking about the church, and we talked about how sometimes people come to church and it's all about me, right? You know, what can this church do for me? What does this church have set up for me? And so it's selfishness. Now, I think this comes from our individualistic society that we live in. There's so many of us, when, uh, people, when they, they think about life, it's like, it's my job, and it's my title, and it's my income, it's, it's my life. And so we're focused on, on, on me. And when we are focused on me, we can't function well in a team. And selfishness brings this, this dysfunction to teams. Another area that we find dysfunction, a uh, characteristic of dysfunction, is disunity. Uh, when you think about disunity, I really think this is one of the things that kills teams quicker than anything else. Uh, if we think about the work world and the places that, that you work or maybe that you have worked, it just takes one person to bring a team down. And, and they can do that through gossip. They, they, they share rumors about people or they just start talking about people on the team and, and that can bring about disunity. Um, anger. You know, the way we respond when something's not going our way or the direction we want it to go. And, and we can be angry and we can bring in angry words and actions to that team that, again, will bring disunity. Or probably the biggest issue, I think, that brings disunity are preferences. Like, we have preferences. Like the team says, hey, we're going to go this way, and you're over here going, no, I'm going to go that way. And so our preferences can bring about this thing called disunity. And again, it will kill a team. But then lastly, there's vision drift. Uh, you've probably experienced this within an organization or, or, again, where you work, where maybe the main vision's not talked about or not talked about a whole lot. It's not focused on. There's no strategy. There's no plan. And here's what people do when that's the case. They will come up with their own vision, right? They, they will come up with their own strategy, their own plan. And when you have this vision drift and it happens in the team settings, again, you're going to find dysfunction. Now, now, we could add all kinds of other characteristics when it comes to teams and dysfunction. But, but this morning, and we can talk about many different areas, I want to talk about what I believe is the greatest team that is out there. And no, I'm not talking about the Dallas Cowboys right now. I'm talking about church. 
Thank you. I heard that clap over there. I'm talking about church. Because sometimes the church is the most overlooked team that exists. And sometimes the church is the most underperforming team that is out there. And so this is a perfect end to our series called The Church is Blank. Now, if you've been here over the past four weeks, and if you haven't, let me kind of give you a real quick synopsis. Uh, Sort of our main theme is that the church is people, right? The, The church is all about people. It's about you and me and us together. And so we've talked about how the church is broken. We've talked about how the church is bold. Last week, we talked about how the church is moving. But today, I want to talk about how the church is one. That the church is one. That The church is about us together, moving in the same direction together, focused on Jesus together. That the church was never created to be dysfunctional. But it kind of goes back to what Lindsay Unity talks about, you know, because imperfect human beings are part of the church there is dysfunction and we talked about that brokenness in our first week but but today i want to talk about how we are called to be one now how do we get to this place of oneness as the church well it really starts with you as an individual because there's this time in in your life where you decide hey I, i want to be all in like, I, I want to I wanna follow Jesus. I want to be baptized. I want to I wanna, I wanna, I wanna do what I can to, to really kind of strengthen my faith, to grow in my faith. And, and that starting point is, is when we give our life to Christ. Now, there's this idea that has been out there for as long as I know and way before I was even born that, that really this is all about this personal relationship with, with Jesus. And so you hear a lot of people talk about how they have this faith, but their faith is personal. And maybe they'll say, hey, you know, my my faith is is personal and 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 I'm good because I follow Jesus, but I really don't need the church. Now, nowhere in Scripture do we read that. Nowhere in Scripture does it even talk about having a personal relationship with Jesus and that's all you have. What you will find is that when you look at Scripture, it talks about people as individuals following Christ But then as soon as this happens, we're called to be part of this bigger thing, this team that we call the church. We've been talking about that term church throughout this series. And and I actually want to talk a little bit about words here because words matter. If you look in the Bible, you're going to find this word temple. And, uh, And the Hebrew word for temple, bet knesset, means this called out assembly. We, 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 or excuse me, this, this uh, house of assembly, this, this location is talking about a, a place. And, and we find this word 625 times in the Old Testament. And so when we, we look at the word temple, what we're really seeing here is this is a place that the Jewish people were connected to God. This is where they would go to worship God, to be near God. Now you would go there too for your community stuff. You would go there to get community news to get community gossip, um, to, to get your education, I don't, maybe to play some pickup basketball. I mean, this was just like this community place, but you would go to that place. And so when you see that term temple, you can kind of understand that because defined, it means this house of assembly. Again, it's, it's like this place you would go to. We've talked about the term church throughout this series, and we find that term 114 times in the new testament now we said that the word that's actually used there that jesus uses is the word ecclesia now here's the technical definition of ecclesia it's a called out assembly so think about those two words there we have temple that's like this house of assembly this place that you go and then we have jesus use this word ecclesia which means this this called out assembly it's not a it's not a location it's not a place that we go to It's about a group of people. We've defined it this way. A group of people that are on mission together, that are called out of a place to live this mission out. Now, Jesus knew the term temple. I mean, he grew up a good Jewish boy. He grew up in a good Jewish family. He he was Jewish in the beginning. And, And you think about that, he understands that word temple. But he doesn't use a word that is similar to temple when he's talking about the church. See, Jesus isn't talking about this place that you would go to. Jesus is talking about who we are called to be. And so when we follow Christ, when we make this decision to follow Jesus, that's not the ending point. 
your, your faith is not personal. You are now a part of something. You're called to be a part of something that's much bigger than that. We're called to be part of this thing called the ecclesia, or as we call it today, the church. And when this ecclesia functions well, amazing things can happen and take place. But again, back to what Lencioni says, there are imperfect human beings that are part of the church too. And when you think about the church, there's lots of moving parts and there's people involved. And guess what? Problems arise, dysfunction can show up. Now, nowhere do we get a better picture of this dysfunction than in some of the letters we read in the New Testament. Now, the book of Acts, if you look at it, it's really the, the beginning of the church. It's the history of the start of the church. But, but, but the details that we find, the nitty-gritty that we see, really comes out of some of these letters that this guy named Paul writes. Because uh, he, he gives you some great insights. We, we get to see the, the good things happening in the church and how God's moving and people following Jesus and encouragement. And it's pretty amazing. But again, we kind of get to see the gritty side. We see the tensions and the struggles and the problems and, and the dysfunctions that are in some of these churches. And this morning, I want to look at one of these churches that, that Paul planted. And um, I want to look at it because it's a dysfunctional church. And if you go back and you read 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, you can read a lot of the, the dysfunction that's there. But I want to give us a little background first about the city because this really, I think, sort of plays into the dysfunctions of, of the church. This is a, a wealthy city. It's set in a, a perfect location for an important trade route between Europe and, and Asia. Really a combination of Greek and, and Roman life there, polytheistic in its, its faith, its religion, but also a very messy city. Uh, some scholars have said, hey, the Corinth is very similar to our present-day Las Vegas. In fact, a couple years back, some archaeologists were doing some research and uh, doing a dig, and they found this plaque, and it's kind of crazy. On this plaque, it says, whatever happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. <laughs> it's amazing when those things just kind of fit so perfectly together. For those of you like, really? It didn't. That's not true, okay? I just don't want you <laughs> telling people that. You could, and they'd probably believe you today. But... Um, but about 50 A.D., Paul goes to Corinth, he moves to Corinth, and he starts this church there. You can read a little bit of those details in Acts chapter 8. But the church there is very similar to the city. It's messy. It's, it's a jacked up church. And again, it's a very dysfunctional place. But Paul writes to remind them, like, hey, I know things aren't perfect. I know there's some struggles. I know there's dysfunction. But you're called to be bigger than that. You're called to be one. And so we're going to look at some passages out of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting with verse 12. Here's what Paul writes to this particular church. He says, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentile, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink, even so the body is not made up of one part, but of many again we, we have this church there it's struggling there's weird stuff happening we're not going to go into the weird stuff you can go back and, and read first and second corinthians but really here's the biggest problem there they're dysfunctional and, and as a team they're not working together they're, they're selfish they're not unified and there's definitely vision drift and paul's like look when you follow jesus you should be one when you follow Jesus, you are part of one body. You're not alone in this. We, we do this together. And he continues to sort of explain what this looks like, again, using this body metaphor. Look at verse 15. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If you do a little research here, what you're going to find, the real problem that Paul is writing about right now is that people were grading the gifts that other people had in the church. And so they were kind of saying, in kind of in our context, like, oh, you speak in front of the church? Oh, you are, you're way more important than those people that are downstairs with Journey Kids. Oh, oh you sing? Or are you playing an instrument in the band? Oh, man, you're so much more important than the people that are out there parking cars. 
And sometimes we think that because that's kind of the, the ranking that we've put within the church. But Paul's like, no, that's not how this works. That, that's not true. And I'm going to have to tell you that I fully agree with Paul. And then he writes this in verse 17. He says, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? Here's Paul that's reminding us that our bodies aren't made up of one part. We're not just a nose, not just an ear, not, not just a belly button. Um, our, our, our body is made up of these different parts, and these parts all work together, and there's not one part that's more important than any other. He says this in verse 18. But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. Let's kind of go back to those gifts that uh, we were talking about just a second ago. In, in the business world, there are these tests that we take to kind of figure out how we are created or what we're kind of made to do or, or who we're made to be and really how we fit into the, the context of, of teams. And so we, we take tests like Strength Finders and Myers-Briggs and the DISC profile and the Enneagram is like the big one today. And again, it's, it's kind of figure out how do we, we fit in, into our business world. Now in the, the church world, we, we really don't talk about those gifts. Now we do as a staff because we want to make sure we've got the right people and hire the right people and everybody's in the right spot. We do do that as a staff and maybe in some leadership positions. But what's really important to us in, in, the, in the church world are spiritual gifts. And what we believe is that when we become a follower of Christ, we are given these spiritual gifts and abilities that we are called to use within this thing that we call the church. But here's the deal. Those gifts aren't ranked, all right? And so if you go to somebody like, hey, I've got this spiritual gift, and they're like, whoa, that's a good one. Let me look here. Oh, you're number two in the list. That's awesome. And then somebody else is like, hey, I've got this gift. And they're like, ooh, that's number 26, not as important. That's not how this is set up. There's no ranking here, okay? They're all the same. The important part is that we use these gifts together. Now, we start out as individuals. We, we start out taking that first step saying, hey, I'm going to be a follower of Jesus. But, but that's not where that thing ends. It, it ends when we come together with those gifts that we have been given to work together as a team. And to live that out in this thing that we call the church. Well, let's scoot on down a little bit to verse 24. Paul says, But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its, its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. A few weeks back, I shared with you that I had the opportunity to play baseball at Wake Forest University for a couple of years, and I told you a story about how I struck out one time, and I just want to say I really appreciate all of you that keep reminding me of that over and over again. <laughs> it does a lot for the self-confidence there, but anyway, um, the one thing I, I, I mean, I enjoyed playing it because it was just an incredible team experience, and I loved it because everyone understood what their role was. And, and it wasn't just the players. I mean, it, the, the roles and how we work together expanded beyond that. Because you had the athletic department itself, and then you had the coaching staff, and then you had the team managers and the athletic trainers, and, and then you get to the players, and you've got starting pitchers and relief pitchers and closers. You've got the starting infield. You've got the starting outfield. You've got guys that would jump in as reserves, and you've got utility players that could play anywhere. And then you had the bullpen catchers, and then you had me, right? I'm at the very end of this whole big list. But but we all knew what our role was. Every single one of us, almost like we had a job description. This is what you are to do on this team. And if you do this and you do it well and you do it together, we can have a great team. We can reach our goals. Now, of course, there were times where maybe that didn't quite happen. Maybe we had one of our players like, hey, I really want to work, work on my batting average. You know, we're struggling right now because I want to get drafted. And if that person looked at themselves as more important than the team, then it would hurt the whole team. It would bring about this dysfunction to the team. And so we always had to be careful with that to make sure we weren't being selfish, to make sure that we, our vision was the same, to make sure we weren't causing any kind of disunity or division. 
Because when we work together, now we may not have been great when we worked together, may not have won games, but when we did it together, we were one. This could be for any setting, because you've probably experienced that in a company, in the military, in your home life, in relationships. We understand the importance of working together. And here's Paul who's saying the church should function in this exact same way. We all have roles to play. We all have work to do, and we do that together in these roles. And when we do that, we can find that the church is living out what God intended the church to live out in the first place, to to be this ecclesia, to be this group, living out this mission together. And so what I want to do right now is we kind of think about this First Corinthian church that was dysfunctional and and maybe some churches you've been a part of before that are dysfunctional. Let me just say this. If you're new here today, I don't think there's dysfunction here at the journey. You may be thinking, oh, what's he? He's getting into some deep stuff. Here's what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about the church universal, right? I'm talking about the church as, as this group of people, billions of people over time who've, who've done this thing called the church. I, I'm just kind of saying, hey, this is what the church should look like. And and I truly believe this is what us as the journey, we should look like too. And I feel like in many ways we, we really live this out. But let me share with you these characteristics that really help us be as the church should be so that the church can, can be one. The first thing I would say is that we need to understand we are a team. And that means that no one is more important than anyone else. Now, some of you think because right before my name it says lead pastor, that I am the most important person here at the journey. And I'm here to tell you today that I am not, okay? That uh, sure, I carry some extra responsibility that you probably don't carry, and I carry a lot of the burden of what happens here at the journey on my shoulders, but I'm not more important than the people who are downstairs working in Journey Kids. I'm not more important than the people that are out helping you park on a Sunday morning. I'm not more important than the people who come and and help mow our lawn. I'm not more important than anybody who's a part of our outreach teams. I'm not. I'm not more important than anyone else here at The Journey. Now, this is one of the reasons why I tell you not to call me Pastor Chad, okay? And I know some of you still do that just because you're making fun because I tell you not to do that. Because when you throw that title pastor in front of my name, here's what you're saying. Hey, Chad, you're more important than I am. And you're not. We're not more important than each other. We, we are in this together. I am just like you, okay? I'm that imperfect human who's a part of this team. We are in this together. And no one is more important than anyone else. And if you're a part of this church, we want you to know that if you're a part of what's happening here, you're not less than anyone else. And at the same time, you're not more than anyone else, too. We we do this together as a team. And whatever your gifts may may be, you bring those to the table. Now, I, I hope I use my gifts that God's given me in the ways I'm supposed to use them. And you should use your gifts in the way that God wants you to use them, too. Whether those gifts are prayer and generosity, teaching, hospitality, administration, faith, whatever it may be, we use them together. And when we do that, that makes us a better team. We're not individuals here. We talked about this a little bit last week. Hey, look, if you come and you show up on a Sunday morning and you're not part of even the smaller teams we have that come out of this bigger team, you're missing out. You're created to be a part of teams. And so last week, and I'm going to do the same thing this week, um, I asked you to, to pull out that connection card that's in front of you. And if you're here in the room, you can grab those. If you're at home, you can uh, click the connection card button at home. Look, we have opportunities for people to jump in and to be a part of the teams here. And so last week, we were talking about Journey Kids. We're like, hey, we need some help in Journey Kids to to help kind of guide the faith and help these kids take their next steps in their faith. And 11 people are like, we're in. And so thank you, those of you that jumped in, thank you for jumping in and being part of that. If you sat there and you're like, man, I don't know, maybe I should do it today, okay? Make that happen today. But we're not just talking Journey Kids. We're talking about people that are ushers, people that are doing parking, the lawnmower team, our outreach team. Jump in and be a part of something bigger than you because you cannot be here and say, my faith is personal, this is about me, and not be a part of the church. We are in this together as a team. We do this together, and no one's role is more important than anyone else. 
First thing we need to remember is that we are a team. The second thing we need to remember is that we are unified. Look, we all have ideas how the church should function. Uh, if I were to ask you, you know, what, how do you think Sunday services should, should look? Or if I ask you, you know, what program should we add? Or, you know, what temperature should the air conditioner be on on a Sunday morning? All of you are going to give us different ideas. You're going to talk about, hey, here's how I think things should be structured. Here's, my, here's what I think programs we should add. Here's the methodology that I think I would follow. Here's what the HVAC should be set up. Many times those are just preferences. They're, they're opinions. And, and as I said a little bit earlier, those preferences can bring about this unity if we're not careful. Uh, Ten years ago, our family planted a church in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And um, it was one of the most faith-growing experiences in, in our entire life. But as we began this church, we you know, had people from the community that we didn't know who started to become a part of this church. And uh, early on, we had this one couple who, who came, they stuck around, they, they knew a few people that were there at the church. They seemed great and friendly. Again, they, they knew some people who were already a part of what we were doing. We had similar, similar church backgrounds. Our theology was, was very much uh, not an issue. And, uh, and there for a little period of time, the wife had some health issues. Our church rallied around them, like, we're going to bring you meals. We're going to help you out. And, you know, it felt like we're doing exactly what we should do. And, you know, in my mind, I'm like, hey, these, these, these people are going to stick around for some time. We had a, held a class at our house, uh, very much like starting point that we do here at The Journey, just talking about our history, which was very short at that point, uh, talking about who we were as a church, why we did the things we did in the community, what was important to us about our, our beliefs, and, and, and again, it seemed to go well. Afterwards, the, the couple called me over, we were actually meeting in our house, they called me over to one of the corners in our living room and said, hey, we love this church, we love the, the things you guys are doing in the community, we agree theologically, and then they used the worst word in the world. They used the word, but. There's always a warning when people use that big word, but, all right? You're always watching out for those big buts when they come. And that was a big but, because they said, here's the deal. We want you to change some things, though. I was like, okay. They said, we want you to change some of the ways you do communion. We want you to change some of the music that you do, and and they're like, hey, here's, here's what's going to happen. If you do these things, we've got a group of people who are kind of following us. We're trying to find, you know, a church because our church has had some struggles. And we're trying to find a church and we're kind of going out and looking. So if you guys make these changes, here's what we're going to do. We're going to bring this group. And I think they said there are like 25 people. They're going to come to this church and be a part of it. I don't know if you've ever been a part of a church plant before. But one of the things you want in a church plant when you're like four or five months old are more people, right? And so they're like, we'll bring more people. It's like, oh, that's interesting. And then they, they said, not only will we bring more people, but these people are, are Christians. They've been following Christ. They give, and they give a lot. And so we'll bring money. You know what else a church plant wants is money. And so we're like, people and money. I thought there, I sat there a second, I thought about it, and I said, here's the deal. You add in a brand new car for me, and you, we're all, man, we're going to make this happen. <laughs> I wanted to say that. I didn't say that. Um, I said, hey, thank you. That's just not going to be who we're going to be. Here's what I really heard there. I heard, hey, we want to come be a part of this church, and we're going to cause problems the whole time. Um, and so we knew, <laughs> thankfully, we were smart enough to see that and understand that. I love how Paul puts it at the very beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. He says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Now, you may have heard what those people have said and thought, well, that's not that big a deal. But I can tell you what would happen. At some point in time, there would be division in of the church because our, our visions our ideas our preferences our methodologies would have crossed paths and would have brought issues see paul here in first corinthians 1 10 let me tell you what's happening in this church cliques are forming now you thought cliques were only in middle school girls but it's not we we find them in churches too 
And the people are arguing. And here's the funny part. It wasn't even theological. They were really arguing about preferences. See, there was a group of people who said, hey, we really like this teacher. and We're going to follow this teacher. And someone else said, oh, really? Well, we like this teacher over here. and We're going to follow this teacher. And another group was like, really? We like this teacher. We're really going to follow this teacher. Again, very little of this was theological in nature. It was preferences. And Paul's like, look, you've got division in the church. You've got dysfunction. And it's not about things that are actually important. He's like, you've got to be of one mind and purpose. You've got to be united. And I'm afraid the reason that 4,000 churches close every single year is based more on preferences than theology. And we don't always have to agree. And we may, as a church, may make some decisions that you may not fully agree with. But here's the deal. We are called to be unified. In the business world, there are meetings that you go to where you're in this meeting and you hear everything and there's this big group. It's like, we're going to go in this direction and you're sitting over there and you're like, I don't think that's the best move. I think this is what we should do. And you get to share that within that meeting. You get to be a part of that. But at some point when you walk out those doors, more than likely you are unified. You're not going to go out and tell everybody, hey, I don't agree with this. We shouldn't do this. Let's don't follow their, their, their lead. No, you may say, hey, I may not fully agree, but I am in this together. We are unified as we move forward. And the church is intended to be not just a team, but to also be unified. And when unity happens, the church grows. And I'm not talking about physical growth. I'm talking about spiritual growth because we grow in this together. And then lastly, I would say is that we have one vision we talked about this a little bit earlier. When you're in an organization, a business where the vision's kind of vague, you're not sure which direction you're supposed to go, and strategy and planning's not really there, it's hard to know which direction, and you, you kind of make them up on your own. And when you make them up on, on your own, then you've got all these different visions that, that we see. Now, here's the great part. We don't have to come up with a vision. As the church, as the church being one, there is one vision, and it came from Jesus. In Matthew 28, he says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right? He says, Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus says, Here's the deal. You want your vision? You go. And you tell people my story. You teach them to obey my teachings. Then you baptize them. And then you disciple them. That's your vision. Now here at the journey, we say we're here to help people take their next steps towards Jesus. But when we talk about that, we're talking about these words. That that is who we are as a church. And guess what? When that person becomes a follower of Christ, it doesn't just end there. Now they're a part of this team and we disciple them. And then their role is to do the exact same thing. And we continue this circular process of, of going and making disciples and teaching and baptizing and the best part is, Jesus says, and I will be with you to the very end of the age. We have one vision. And that's why we exist as a church. That's why we've been talking about the Acts 1-8. That's why we are the witnesses for Jesus in this world. We are called to be a team that is unified, that is living out this mission every single day. You and I were called out to something bigger than ourselves, which means we have to get rid of our selfishness. We have to get rid of any disunity, division we may want to bring. we got to get rid of any vision drift we have. And we must follow Jesus. And in following Jesus, we do this as a team, unified on this mission together. My prayer through this series is that we can understand what the church is. And it's not perfect. And this church is not perfect because we are a part of it. But we are called to be together, to live this mission out as one. And when the church does that, God will bless it. And again, I'm not talking about numbers here. I'm talking about spiritually. That lives will be changed, your life and my life. And that this world will be a better place to live in because we have been focused on that vision as a team that's unified.